Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our evening program tonight. Happy International Epilepsy Day. Uh, we are so happy to have you, and we are so happy to have our speakers this evening. We want to thank you for attending. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Your audio and video will be muted throughout the entire pre presentation, but you do have the opportunity to ask questions. And the way that you do that is down at the very bottom of your screen, there is a chat box. Uh, any questions that you have that come up during the speakers, um, we just ask that you write your uh, question in there. And then after the program, um, we will ask our speaker, we'll, uh, share those questions with the speakers, and uh, they'll get the information back to you. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to uh, Missy Dalloway, uh, the president and CEO for tonight, and then I'll come back uh, to myself. Take it away, Missy. Thanks, Carrie. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Missy Dalloway. I am the president and CEO of the Epilepsy Foundation Eastern Pennsylvania. I am absolutely thrilled to have you here with us this evening. Happy International Epilepsy Day. Um, so to get things started, I just wanted to give a really brief um, overview about epilepsy and about the foundation. Um, so when it comes to epilepsy, First and foremost, please know that you are not alone. Um, you know, epilepsy is frequently regarded as a rare disorder, but as you look at the facts and figures on your screen here, it, it's really quite common. So uh, one in 26 people will be diagnosed with epilepsy in their lifetime. And actually one in 10 people will experience a seizure at some point. Um, there's 3.4 million people living with epilepsy in the US and over 110,000 people right here in Eastern Pennsylvania that are affected by epilepsy. So it's really a, a lot more common than most people think. And, and we believe a lot of that comes down to because a lot of people don't talk about their epilepsy. So we're here to change that and, and to talk about it and to learn together and, and uh, share our stories. So we, as the Epilepsy Foundation Eastern Pennsylvania, are here to serve and support you. Uh, we are headquartered in Philadelphia, but we serve the 18 counties of Eastern Pennsylvania. So we go all the way up to the uh, scranton wilkes area, out to Lancaster, Lehigh Valley, everywhere in between. Um, our mission is to stop seizures in SUDEP find a cure and overcome the challenges created by epilepsy through efforts including education, advocacy, and research to accelerate ideas and the therapies. Um, so we are here and we provide a wide range of free uh, support services, programs, and resources. Um, we're here to help you any and every way that we can. So on your screen here is um, just a sampling of the wide range of support services and programs that we have available to you. Um, Project School Alert, we will come into your child's school to lead seizure recognition and first aid trainings with teachers, school personnel, school nurses, the students. Um, we do the same or similar types of seizure recognition and first aid trainings with first responders and law enforcement. Uh, we'll come into businesses and companies uh, wherever there is a need Wherever we are welcome, we will come in, we'll lead these trainings. Um, of course, all of these trainings are being led virtually over Zoom right now. So they're um, really easy for us to set up, really easy for us um, to facilitate. Um, if you uh, would like us to lead a training at your child's school or your company, please let us know. We're happy to set that up. Um, we offer monthly support groups um, all across our region. Again, these are all happening virtually right now. So um, you're really able to, to jump in and tune in to any and every that, that fit with your schedule and your availability. Uh, we lead advocacy efforts at a state and federal level. Uh, we're always looking for folks to get involved in these legislative efforts. Um, we offer educational conferences and webinars all throughout the year. Um, our educational conferences are frequently referred to as our epilepsy education exchanges, um, and they, uh, they normally are regional conferences, but again, we are live streaming all of our conferences over Zoom during these times um, and in the future moving forward. So again, you're able to tune into any and every conference as um, they interest you. Uh, we do a really 
great job at um, finding the best speakers to present on um, the latest topics and trends in the epilepsy space. So always putting out really informative uh, talks for our community members. Um, also a whole bunch of webinars such as this that you're, uh, that you're tuning into tonight. We're, we're continuing to plan more as we all you know, kind of continue to be stuck home. We wanna make sure that we have as much information going out to you as possible. Um, we have a wide range of youth services available one of our star programs being Camp Achieve. That is our week-long sleepaway camp for children ages 8 to 17 living with epilepsy. Um, it's at Camp Green Lane in Green Lane, PA. Um, just a really wonderful week for kids to meet other kids living with epilepsy, to participate in all normal, traditional summer camp activities. Just a really special week. We also offer, offer Youth Achieve. Um, so kind of carrying that programming through the year. Um, Youth Achieve is the second Saturday of every month from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, we also have young adult services. Uh, we offer a young adult retreat every May, which is um, also at Camp Green Lane, another really wonderful weekend. We also have our Young Friends of the Foundation group, which is a social group that meets monthly. Um, they plan get-togethers um, in, in normal times, um, and fundraisers, and, and just a really fun group of, of friends getting together, as well as our adult services. Um, so that being our support groups, one-on-one -on -one consultations, um, as well as our adult wellness weekend. So we launched our first adult wellness weekend last September as a virtual retreat, and we are looking forward to having our first in-person adult wellness weekend this coming September. Last but not least, I wanted to tell you about um, our annual gala this year. Of course, we cannot be having it in person, but we are really excited to be launching our brand new virtual Mardi Gras Gala Carnival Weekend. So it's going to be this weekend long, fun packed weekend from Friday, March 5th to Sunday, March 7th. Um, so Friday night, we are going to be having a donation based virtual poker tournament with um, lots of fun prizes that you can win and, and just you know get involved in a little friendly competition. On Saturday, that's going to be the day that's most reminiscent of our traditional gala. Um, so we are going to have um, time to, to celebrate our community, our mission, and our foundation. Uh, we have a full community showcase planned of our singers, dancers, comedians, and poets. We're going to have pro professional uh, live music entertainment provided by EBE, as always. Um, we will have our online um, silent auction, a community-wide 50-50, just a really fun night of celebration. And then Sunday, we have our virtual uh, bingo. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So, so if you're a bingo player, definitely sign up to, uh, to play with us uh, on Sunday. Again, lots of great prizes to, to win. Um, so if you're interested in any or all of the weekend festivities, just head to www.MardiGrasPhilly.org. Um, you can fundraise for your ticket. You can purchase a ticket. Um, lots of different options there, but uh, definitely a fun weekend to get involved in uh, from the comfort of home. Thank you, Missy. Carrie, I had one more slide. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to give a big shout out and thank you to our corporate sponsors. Um, without our corporate partners, we would not be able to do the work that we do with our community members. Um, they sponsor events like tonight. Um, they help us uh, be able to continue providing free programs and services. So I wanted to give a huge thank you to our friends at UCB, ASI and Greenwich Biosciences for uh, sponsoring our webinar tonight. And um, that's all I've got. Thank you again so much for joining. Without further ado, I will pass it back to my friend, Carrie. Thank you, Missy. So before we get started with the program, I guess I should tell you who I am. My name is Carrie Mickna. I'm the Lancaster Resource Coordinator for the Foundation. Um, so I service Lancaster and Berks counties, but I'm so excited to do this event tonight. Um, as Missy mentioned, a lot of our programs are virtual. And so now I'm interacting with um, a lot of people because we don't have those geographic uh, restraints anymore. I'm interacting with all kinds of people and getting to, new, to meet new people, which is really great. Um, I wanted to tell you before we get started that um, the 
one of the benefits too, to all of this virtual stuff is that we're getting to do a lot of online training. Um, and some of these are listed here. We are really stacked for the month of February. I mean, pretty much there's something for everyone. Uh, training for nurses, uh, February 16th in the evening. Training for teachers and school personnel, Wednesday, February 17th in the evening. Caesar recognition and first aid for the general public and caregivers, which is great. Um, that's pretty much anybody um, could benefit from that training. It's an hour training packed full of information. Um, training for elementary school students, which is a really great program. Um, management for law enforcement training. Recognition and management for law enforcement training is Wednesday, February 24th, another evening program. And we are having a recognition and first aid training for first responders, which is Thursday, February 25th from 5.30 to 7. You can visit our website, www.efpa.org slash webinars and trainings. And you will see all of our trainings that are available. You can also contact us and we can set up a training specifically for you at a specific date and time. The webinar schedule for this evening, we are going to launch any minute now with our first guest. Um, you can see there she's going to speak and then we'll take some questions and answers via that chat box and then we'll get started with our second speaker and then some more questions and answers and um, wrap up the evening. So without further ado, our first speaker tonight that I am just thrilled uh, to introduce is Dr. Joyce Liberace. She's going to be doing epilepsy in Tanzania case studies. So Joyce Liberace, MD, is a general neurologist at Penn Neuroscience Radnor, PA. She graduated from Johns Hopkins Medical School and completed her neurology re residency at the University of Pennsylvania. She completed a fellowship in clinical neuropsychology, I'm sorry, physiology and epilepsy at the University of Pennsylvania. She has an expertise in women's health and epilepsy. She has been named a top doctor for several consecutive years by Philadelphia Magazine, Mainline Magazine, and US News and World Reports. She is a member of the board of the Epilepsy Foundation of Eastern Pennsylvania. Her clinical goal is to listen intently to patients, make an accurate diagnosis, and provide an individualized treatment plan. She has a keen interest in global health, and has traveled to Africa to provide medical care to the people of Tanzania. She hopes to return to traveling soon, as do we all, Joyce. So without further ado, Thank can you, you very hear much, me, Joyce? Carrie. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you really might be wonderful. muted. It's really wonderful to see so many people. We can't hear the... you, Joyce. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, there I... you go. Uh, good, great. Um, <laughs> good evening, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak, Carrie, and thank you to the Epilepsy Foundation of Eastern Pennsylvania. It's wonderful to see so many people on this call, um, and I, I'm really grateful that you will be learning a little bit more about the global perspective uh, tonight. We, can't, about we cannot wait to hear it. I'm going to stop sharing, and then if you want to launch your screen, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Okay, so terrific. So um, International Epilepsy Day was started just recently in 2015, and it is to promote awareness of epilepsy, also to acknowledge and highlight the problems faced by people with epilepsy, their families and their caregivers. And this has been a joint effort with the International Bureau for Epilepsy and the International League Against Epilepsy. For tonight, I'm going to speak a little bit about epilepsy in general and pay special attention to epilepsy in Africa. We're going to speak about care limitations, stigma, as well as prevention of epilepsy. And then I will review some of my experiences in caring for some patients in Tanzania. First, a definition, epilepsy is a brain disease where people have two or more seizures that occur more than, 40, more than 24 hours apart, or if you have a single seizure, but your chance of having further seizures is actually quite high based on either an abnormal EEG, 
or abnormal brain imaging, or if you have a diagnosis of an epilepsy syndrome. One very important fact to keep in mind is that anyone with a brain can have epilepsy. We already learned a little bit about this, but in the United States, 10% of people will have a single seizure and one in 26 people will have epilepsy. Overall, the lifetime prevalence of epilepsy in the world is 7.6 people per thousand population. So you certainly are not alone. It is further estimated that about 70% of people with epilepsy, if they had proper treatment and medication, they could be seizure free. Many countries, however, do not have standalone policies on epilepsy. And this is often included just in their general health policies or within mental health policies. And I experienced this myself while I was in Tanzania, we had someone from the government come and give a talk about mental health policies. And I was actually very surprised that she spent about five or 10 minutes speaking about epilepsy. In 2014, Kenya launched a national plan for epilepsy with wonderful goals. They would like to mobilize and train healthcare staff, create awareness and provide community education, provide healthcare services and obtain funding for research. So very similar to what the goals of our Epilepsy Foundation of Eastern Pennsylvania are. The global burden of epilepsy, there are 50 million people of all ages around the world who have epilepsy. And 80% of those people with epilepsy will live in low to middle income countries. Africa has a very high incidence of act active epilepsy with very few neurologists. I was very surprised to learn that there's only one neurologist for every 3 million people in Africa. And in comparison, in the United States, uh, sometimes I feel like I'm uh, by myself out here, but there are there's one neurologist for every 20,000 people. So often there's a need to integrate epilepsy treatment into primary care to allow other providers to help provide care for our patients with epilepsy. And there's really a huge problem with limited access to medications, which we'll learn a little bit more about when we talk about our cases. In 2019, the World Health Organization launched its first global report on epilepsy. And again, it's to raise prioritization of epilepsy on the global agenda. The World Health Organization every year publishes a list of essential medications. And in 2019, there were 460 total medications for all disorders and diseases. And there were 10 anti-seizure medications, many of the names you would recognize, Tegretol, Phenobarbital, Dilantin, Lamictal, on and on. And of course, many of you are thinking, hmm, I'm on Levetiracetam and my drug is not on there. So you can see there are a lot of drugs that are really not on the list of essential medications. And the list also includes magnesium sulfate, which sometimes we actually forget about. However, even when medications are available, the supply can be interrupted due to cost or inadequate knowledge of the need to continue treatment, which was a common theme that I saw. And that can lead to the risk of withdrawal seizures or even status epilepticus with prolonged seizures. There's a very high rate of non-compliance with medications for a variety of reasons. Many people rely on alternative treatments such as prayer, herbs, or potions. And many people also believe that there are supernatural causes of epilepsy, such as bad spirits or witchcraft. We need to improve access to anti-seizure medications and really have that as an essential component of policy development to improve lives of people with epilepsy. Ideally, all governments would have a policy for procurement of medications and also provide training to healthcare providers. This slide for prevention of epilepsy is Dr. James, one of my favorite doctors at FAME, and he is here uh, with three beautiful African women. You, you would never guess, but all three of these women are in active labor and they all delivered healthy babies later that day. So that's where we start actually with prevention is we can help to prevent epilepsy by having healthier babies. There's a real nutrition issue in Africa and uh, many women actually decide not to uh, eat a lot of calories when they're pregnant because they prefer to deliver 
small babies so that they won't have complications during delivery. Also, we could have prompt treatment of infections as well as stroke um, to reduce the risk of epilepsy. And one enormous reduction would be reducing head trauma. And that accounts for about 25% of all the cases with epilepsy. There's a very high rate of stigma. We, I think a lot of people on the call have experienced stigma as well. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the rate of refusing to have your child marry someone with epilepsy ranges from 33% in Cameroon to 88% in Nigeria. Additionally, the school programs that the Epilepsy Foundation of Eastern Pennsylvania has would be wonderful in Africa. Most teachers do not receive any training and they lack the confidence to work with students who have epilepsy. There's also a higher um, rate of unemployment and uh, employment is affected by fear uh, of having a seizure, rejection, and as well as hostility in the workplace. This high rate of stigma leads to a rate, high rate of depression and anxiety and a poorer quality of life, which leads to poor family functioning. And there's a very high risk of injury with seizures in homes. One thing that I really hadn't recognized before going is that many homes do not have electricity and meals are cooked with open fires. And you can imagine the very bad combination of someone having a seizure and being very close to an open fire. Burns are quite common in Africa. Now we're gonna to go to Tanzania. Uh, Tanzania is in East Africa. It's below the equator. And the national language in Tanzania is Swahili. Many languages are spoken there. Many people travel to Tanzania to hike Mount Kilimanjaro, which is uh, 19,341 feet at its summit. I must say I had absolutely no desire to hike Mount Kilimanjaro, but I certainly respect people that decide they would like to do that. 68% of Tanzania's 45 million citizens live below the poverty line of $1.25 a day. And the average salary is uh, $60 a month. So I traveled to Fame Medical. Fame Medical is located outside of a small town called Karatu. Karatu is about a three hour drive from the airport in Kilimanjaro. And it is a wonderful, comprehensive outpatient clinic, also has an inpatient ward. There's a large uh, 16 bed maternity center, which opened while I was there. They have four delivery rooms, a special care nursery. There's an emergency room, uh, also a night clinic and two operating rooms. And this all started with a small outpatient clinic in 2008. And I'm happy to report that in 2019, Fame Medical treated 28,413 outpatients um, and they delivered 689 babies. They also have a mobile medical service and that includes uh, services for epilepsy care. Now Fame Medical started because of these people, Dr. Frank Artress and his lovely wife, Susan, Mama Susan. And it started with a Kilimanjaro hike that went terribly wrong back in 2002. Dr. Frank and Mama Susan decided to hike Kilimanjaro for birthdays. And while they were uh, on the mountain, Dr. Frank, a American cardiac anesthesiologist, nearly died. He went into flash pulmonary edema and he recognized that if he did not get down off the mountain, he would likely not survive. So he, um, after that terrible near-death experience, um, he and Susan took stock of their lives. They decided to sell everything they owned. They uprooted their lives in the United States and they moved to Tanzania. And if you'd like to learn more about Fame Medical, I would point you to their uh, website, which is www.fameafrica.org. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about it. So here are the uh, Fame staff. There are 15 Tanzanian doctors. There are 55 fabulous nurses and 92 other medical uh, and support staff. It really is a gem. It's a wonderful place. 
The social workers are two wonderful people, Angel and Kitashu, who go above and beyond caring for individuals and doing anything that's needed to, to help with all aspects of patients' lives. There's a laboratory on site. Um, in the upper right-hand corner is Dr. Joyce Cuff, who lives in Tanzania. And uh, she's an expat from New Hampshire. And she has set up a wonderful laboratory that has a wide range of laboratory studies, uh, which really is a wonderful um, asset to, to the hospital as well as the outpatient clinic. You'd be surprised to also know that there is a CAT scan and an x-ray machine. In 2019, they did over 1,700 x-rays and over 270 uh, CAT scans. There is an epilepsy clinic at Fame Medical started by Dr. Mike Rubenstein from HUP. He traveled to Tanzania on safari and fell in love with the country. And he has returned to Fame Medical uh, twice per year. He goes, uh, he spends two months. So every six months he spends a month uh, in Tanzania and has a neurology clinic. He brings with him Penn Neurology residents as well as Children's Hospital's uh, Pediatric Neurology residents, which is a wonderful uh, part of their training. And Dr. Ann Gatti, who's pictured here, um, is uh, learning uh, side by side with the neurology team and is really becoming an expert uh, in neurology. Now you may sort of wonder, well, how, how do these patients, how are patients seen? Um, for the cost of 5,000 Tanzanian shillings, uh, which is $2.15, patients are uh, able to see the physician at the neurology clinic. They can get whatever laboratories they might need. And they also get at least a month's worth of medication. But of course, that's still quite an expense uh, for, for many people in Tanzania. I'm gonna tell you about a few cases. We're gonna walk through a few. Um, this is one of the first patients that I saw in the outpatient clinic. I was asked to go see a 39-year-old man because of syncope or fainting spells. And as I was sitting and getting his history with the help of a Swahili interpreter, he reported that he was having multiple events over the years where he would suddenly have a loud cry he would then lose consciousness, fall to the ground, stiffen, jerk his arms and legs, and it would last about two to three minutes, and afterwards he would feel quite tired. So many of you on the call will recognize that that really is not a fainting spell, that what he described is a tonic-clonic seizure, very likely a frontal lobe tonic-clonic seizure, and I did an examination and really didn't find a lot, but I did notice that he was wearing a knit cap on his head. And so towards the end of the examination, I asked him to remove the cap. And in fact, there was quite a surprise finding. He had a skull defect uh, in his frontal area. And I, of course, asked what happened. And he said that about 10 years prior, so just as these events were starting, he had actually been attacked by, he said cat, what he really meant was leopard. Uh, a leopard actually took a bite out of his skull. And so he had sutures placed, but he still had a skull defect. And he was started on carbamazepine and uh, to follow up with the neurology clinic. And I certainly hope he is now event free, seizure free. One of the first cases I saw in the emergency department was a student, Justin. Uh, Justin presented to the emergency room with seizures. He uh, is an 18 year old uh, student. He had his first seizure at age 13 and he had been uh, treated with medication and was seizure free. So at age 16, he stopped his medication. He had seizures at school, several seizures at school. Uh, he came to the uh, emergency department and I witnessed seizures there as well. He had left arm stiffening, followed then by right arm stiffening and jerking with loss of awareness. I gave him IV Valium and IV phenobarbital and luckily his seizures stopped rather quickly. 
I asked for a head CT because of the focal nature of his seizures and we were able to get the head CT rate at FAME and it showed a large uh, right frontal lesion, uh, which was causing some mass and pressure effects on his brain. He needed to see, uh, he needed to have a neurosurgeon uh, intervene and relieve that pressure. So we were able to call a neurosurgeon, a doc, her name's Dr. Happiness Rabiel, and she very quickly accepted the patient and transfer, and she operated on him the next day successfully. And he was doing well, however, um, a sad story, as there are many sad stories in Tanzania. One month postoperatively, he went into prolonged seizures. And unfortunately, he died at home while his family was trying to find transportation to the clinic. It's a very typical story of, of the hardships that people experience in Tanzania. Now that same day, in fact, just about five minutes after we took care of Justin, another student arrived, this time 16 years old with a prior history of epilepsy as well as pulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, he had been treated with carbamazepine, but was no longer taking it. And that day he presented with more than 10 seizures in just 24 hours. So certainly uh, very concerning uh, with his presentation. He was also given IV phenobarbital and Valium. And I did request again, uh, a head CT. I had concerns because of his pulmonary tuberculosis that he could possibly have lesions in his brain, but his family could not afford the head CT. And so he was treated with carbamazepine and sent home without any further workup, but to return to the neurology clinic. Here's an inpatient case. This was James, 22 year old, who presented with new onset focal seizures and he had twitching of the left side of his face, uh, as well eye deviation to the left, and he denied any risk factors for epilepsy, and in Africa we do ask about ingestion of pork or working with pigs because of a risk of infection, and he said no, absolutely not. He had his head CT completed, and in fact he has a small lesion in his right frontal lobe and looks very much like uh, the pork tapeworm, which is neurosister sarcosis. So I returned to his bedside, asked his family to leave, and again asked if he <laughs> was eating any pork. And he said, yes, that he loved pork and he was eating it actually a, a, once a month or so. Uh, humans can become infected if uh, pork is undercooked and he made me promise that I would not tell his family. So I did not tell him, uh, tell his family. One thing that I thought was really very interesting is the Swahili word for pork is kitimoto, which is hot seat. So anyone who eats <laughs> pork definitely has, uh, is uh, sitting in a hot seat. Now, after leaving uh, FAME, so in Dr. Mike and his team is there for two months out of the year, but of course the physicians see cases uh, and could use some um, help with uh, neurology care. So through WhatsApp, we're able to communicate with, with the team at FAME. So often they'll present cases to us. This uh, case is two-year-old Joseph. Uh, here's uh, Joseph pictured in the red sweatshirt with his lovely mom. Joseph is actually the son of Kitashu, the social worker that I uh, uh, presented earlier. And uh, Joseph had had trauma in October of uh, 2020. He fell off of a table. He did lose consciousness for about 15 minutes but then he was acting his, he was his normal self and everything seemed back to normal. In, on November 19th of 2020, he presented to fame with seizures and a high fever. He was admitted to the hospital, treated with antibiotics, and it was thought that perhaps the seizure was related to the high fever. However, two days later, uh, while he did not have a fever, he had prolonged seizures. He had a seizure that lasted about an hour, followed then by another 15 minute seizure. He had a CAT scan head CT done at Fame Medical, which was abnormal. 
The team in the United States suggested an MRI scan to further uh, determine what, what was wrong. Uh, however, an MRI scan cost 600,000 Tanzania shillings, uh, which is about $275, which is quite expensive. Plus there would be the cost of uh, getting to the MRI scanner. And the closest scanner was in Arusha, which was about three hours by car. So the MRI was not done. Joseph was treated with carbamazepine, but unfortunately continued to have seizures. The team um, suggested that we might try levetiracetam, which is Keppra. Uh, levetiracetam was available when I was there. Um, however, it was no longer available, so it could not be used. So instead, diazepam, just you know, Valium, was added to his carbamazepine regimen. And he was discharged home on carbamazepine and was then tapered off his diazepam. And I'm quite happy to report that Joseph remains uh, free of seizures. But this is a really very good example of how access to medications is a huge uh, burden to care for people with epilepsy. Now I wanted to show a few pictures uh, from Tanzania. This is uh, in one of the inpatient rooms. This little girl came to us with pneumonia, looking actually very ill. Um, however, after giving her the correct antibiotics within about uh, 24 hours, she perked up and became her usual self. She was a, a little doll. And uh, this is uh, when I went to visit Kitashu's um, family. Kitashu, the social worker, is Maasai. And so on the weekends, he returns to his Maasai village. And these are the children uh, in the village that I uh, was able to go and visit, which is a, was a wonderful opportunity. <laughs> you can see I was wearing scrubs. And yes, uh, I was playing hooky from work. I was supposed to be working. That was a Saturday. Uh, but because I had an opportunity to go to the village, I, I took it. Uh, here's a picture of Kitashu, uh, the social worker, and this is Jen, and Jen is actually on the call today, so it's nice to see her joining us. Uh, Jen is a nurse. She's in New Hampshire. Now she's working uh, with a lot of COVID patients, and uh, when she and I worked together, we became fast friends, and uh, we, we really enjoyed working together, and she is quite a hiker, so she gave me a lot of exercise while I was there. Um, I, the, the kids um, in the village uh, really enjoyed our visit as well, and um, just a wonderful day uh, visiting, visiting him uh, in, in Gorongoro Crater. Now, when you go to the Maasai uh, village, you are usually greeted uh, by the entire village, and they will uh, often uh, sing a song and do a dance for you, which is just a wonderful way to welcome people uh, in, in, into the village. It really does make you feel that you're part, part of the family. Here is a shot of the Ngorongoro crater and just wherever you look, there are animals uh, everywhere. It's just a, a beautiful, uh, really uh, beautiful scene. I kept trying to get good pictures of zebras. I think this was one of my better pictures. This is a hippo. The hippos uh, often hide in the water trying to get away from the sun and this hippo seemed to be quite happy hide, hiding in the, in the vegetation. Here was a traffic jam uh, uh, in, <laughs> in Tanzania. This was the very first elephant that I saw in Tanzania, just an incredibly majestic creature and so lovely to see with the beautiful long tusk. Um, it was, uh, I strongly encourage if anyone has an opportunity to get to Africa and go on safari, uh, uh, take it. It's, it's a wonderful experience. So I want to thank you very much in Swahili, that is Asante Sana, for your attention. And I um, wanted to also let everybody know that today, in addition to being International Epilepsy Day, is also Sue Livingston's birthday. So happy birthday, Sue. Sue is on the call as well. 
And um, I think we have a bit of time for some questions. Yes. Hi, Joyce. I'm here. This is Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Hi. Uh, okay. So one of the questions is, how did you get involved? Oh, well, so, you know, uh, my family and I decided to go on vacation and take safari and go on safari. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I planned this whole safari. I'm quite a planner. And I had a, an afternoon for about three hours that I was going to be free. So I just looked around and thought I would really like to go see a clinic or a hospital. So just by circumstance, I, I came across Fame Medical and I sent in, I just sent a message and said, would I be able to, vil uh, to visit when I'm there for, um, you know, for safari? And they said, of course. And they, so they sent me some information and I saw that they actually were accepting medical volunteers. So of course, my next question was, well, can I actually stay there and, and just volunteer to work? And it turns out that uh, in 2019, they had 55 volunteers. So, um, so I was just able to, to stay there and they have, a, it was a wonderful opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the next question is from Facebook. How does antibiotic treatment help address seizures? Oh, good question. So I think you're referring to Joseph. Mm -hmm. So Joseph was treated with antibiotics, uh, thinking that the high fever in a, in a young child was actually what was causing his seizures. So that if you address oh, okay. the underlying problem of an infection, then the, then the seizures, you know, would not occur. Uh, here's another one about one of the case studies. The person is asking, how did the man get rid of the worm in his brain? Oh, that's a really good question. So um, <laughs> it's not always treated. So, uh, you know, this, this gentleman had a, just a single lesion and sometimes people opt to not treat, but there are anti-parasitic um, treatments. In fact, I just saw somebody in the United States um, who had six or seven lesions um, and it's neurocystocercosis. Uh, so uh, it, it, it can be treated with a medication called albendazole, often treated with steroids as well, just to make sure there's not a, a big inflammatory reaction to it, but it's not always treated. Okay. And somebody has a question about medications. Uh, you had mentioned that they're available for a month to them with that fee. Um, they'd like to know, are there more drugs available? Are most drugs used in the U.S. for epilepsy? For epilepsy available there also. Um, who covers the cost? Do they pay for additional meds that they need after that month? And how do they get them? Through the clinic? Yeah, uh, yeah really, really good, really good questions. So um, in general, there are very few medications that are used to treat epilepsy in Tanzania. The medications that typically are used are phenobarbital, uh, Depakote, Tegretol, and then a little bit of Keppra, which is levetiracetam. And um, so although that fee for the clinic covers one month, many people are given more than one month worth of medication. And, um, but patients do have to pay for it themselves, which of course is a huge, a huge hardship. So uh, families, families have to pay and, um, you know, it's not, it's not as expensive as if you were paying for medication here, but it definitely is a burden to patients. Well, and so that brings me to another um, question someone had. Is there a, a place that people could donate if they wanted to to the clinic? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So you can go to that uh, fameafrica.org website and you could, if you'd like, you can even give a targeted donation for epilepsy and that, that money will then go to help people uh, in, with epilepsy. Wonderful. And last question right now is, well, one second, what is the fate, what is your favorite part of your job? Do you just diagnose patients, just treat them or both? Well, I, I do <laughs> everything for sure. Um, some of the favorite things I, I guess are being able to take care of people over a long period of time and 
so I'll just explain. So, so I, I care for a lot of people, a lot of women who are planning pregnancies and um, it's a very challenging time, of course. Uh, all women, when they're pregnant, they worry about the outcomes of their, of their fetus. What, what would their baby be like? Um, and the nice thing now is I've been in practice in this area for over 30 years. So I have a lot of patients whose um, kids are in college or have graduated from college. One of my favorite things in the beginning of doing telemedicine was one of my epilepsy moms um, who had a very challenging time with seizures uh, uh, about 10 years ago. When I signed in to speak with her, her 10 year old daughter popped in. And um, so I was able to tell her about how much trouble she was for her mom. 10 years ago. And she's a very bright, lovely young girl. And she actually sang me a little song. And then she tried to get me to help her with her homework. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay, are you still there, Joyce? I am. So I see somebody said something about um, what's your favorite part of Tanzania and how often do you go? Yeah. Yeah, so um, certainly hands down, my favorite part of Tanzania are the people. And I was um, set to go again in May of uh, 2020. And actually my uh, youngest son was supposed to join me. He is a medical student medical student graduating in May and about to go into neurology. So I was very excited that the two of us were going to travel back to Tanzania and work at Fame Medical. But of course, with COVID, that was canceled. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to going back again sometime uh, in 2021. I'm but certainly sure. it's the people. The people are incredible. Um, it really, when you're there and you're interacting with the people of Tanzania, you just automatically want to be a better person because people there are so fantastic. Oh, what an awesome note to end on, Joyce. Well, That's thank amazing. You, thank you very much. When you're presenting, you can just, you, your love for the people and uh, the work there just comes through. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for, thank you for inviting me. Yes, of course. So I am excited, Joyce, if, yeah, I'm gonna screen share now again. I'm gonna try to screen share. One moment. We're going to introduce our second speaker for the evening as soon as the technical stuff cooperates with us. Okay, so next up, I am so excited. I've been trying to get this guy, I don't know if he realizes this, I've been trying to get him to Lancaster for years. And so, uh, by sheer luck with everything being virtual, I am so excited now he can join us. So this next speaker is Tony Coelho, uh, Epilepsy Adventures, a, dy a Dynamic Cultural Journey. Um, Mr. Coelho is with the Epilepsy Foundation of America and he's on the board of directors. So a little bit about Tony Coelho has lived many rich and colorful experiences, which he's going to share with you. They have led him to where he is today. While serving in the U.S. House of Representatives, Mr. Coelho, who has epilepsy, authored the Americans with Disabilities Act, widely recognized as the most important piece of civil rights legislation drafted in the last 30 years. Mr. Coelho's formal, former and current business affiliations include service on a number of corporate boards, including Epilepsy Foundation of America, where he currently serves as a board member. So I have heard uh, Mr. Coelho speak twice now, and uh, I guarantee this is something you do not want to miss. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Carrie. It's great to be here and to be with all of you. I know that uh, Jeff is on the line and Josh is on the line, two individuals that I've uh, worked with in regard, regards to their epilepsy. 
So hello to both of them. And, and Dr. Joyce, it uh, was great listening to you in regards to your presentation. What I'd like to do <clears throat> is talk a little bit about what happened to me and, and uh, uh, what I think is one of the biggest problems we face as individuals uh, with epilepsy. And that is what I call stigma. Now, stigma is true in practically all disabilities, but it is definitely true in, stigma, in epilepsy. And so I'll start off with when I was about 16, I had an automobile accident, actually a pickup truck accident on my family's dairy farm. I hit my head uh, as the pickup went into the canal, but I floated out and uh, I had a, a headache, uh, but the truck was totaled. So I wasn't too concerned about my headache. I was more worried about my dad, what my dad was gonna do to us uh, when he found out the truck was totaled. Um, but a year later, I was in the barn milking cows and I woke up and I was um, in bed in the house. My brother had carried me uh, to the house. I had had a, what I called at the time, what my parents called was a passing out spell. And uh, so I was out, I'd had a grand mal seizure, but they called it a passing out spell. And the doctor was there and he um, talked to my parents as in those days, as someone 16, 17 years old, uh, doctors didn't talk to you. They talked to your parents or an older person because of course you as the patient don't really know much uh, uh, about what to do or not do. Um, and so <clears throat> the doctor told my parents that I was sure that I had epilepsy and, um, and my parents didn't tell me that of course. Uh, then they decided to take me to two other doctors to find out what it really was. Uh, both of those doctors talked to my parents, and, and as I found out much later, they said I had epilepsy as well. Um, now, what you have to know is that my parents, being Portuguese and devout Catholics, uh, they were always taught that if you have epilepsy, uh, you're possessed by the devil. Um, I always tell uh, folks that my Portuguese friends know I'm possessed. I mean, excuse me, my Republican friends know that I'm possessed, but uh, I, I don't think uh, that that's the case. But after those three doctors, then my family took me to witch doctors. And uh, after the third witch doctor, I said, uh, I no longer would go to any witch doctors and that um, I uh, uh, would just accept what I had not knowing it was epilepsy now, uh, except that I would, would I'd have. And I had uh, passing out spells um, uh, over and over. And I just, you know, uh, once I had them, uh, of course, I rested a bit. Then I got up and kept on doing what I was doing. I went to college at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles um, and uh, had these passing out spells. Uh, when I was a senior, I decided that instead of being a trial lawyer, I wanted to be a Catholic priest. Uh, and here comes another stigma point. I uh, went to the doctor for a physical. Uh, the doctor said, have you ever heard the word epilepsy? I said, no. He said, well, that's what you have. And uh, I was thrilled because I found out what these passing, passing out spells were. Um, then um, he said, I can give you some medication uh, to help you control the seizures, uh, et cetera. And, and that made me happy because all of a sudden, not only did I know what I had, now I had uh, a drug that maybe would help me. Then he said, uh, I have some good news and bad news. The good news, 1964, is that uh, I was 4F and could not serve in Vietnam. The bad news is that uh, I had epilepsy and the Catholic Church in 400 AD uh, changed canon law to say that if you have epilepsy or possessed by the devil, you can't be a priest. So I was denied entry into the seminary stigma. 
I then, um, I was student body president, outstanding senior in college, so I had a lot of job offers, et cetera. So I started going to get an interview and every job application, the word epilepsy was there. And I checked the box and I never got an interview. And when I talked to my parents and said that I finally knew what my situation was, my parents said, no son of ours has epilepsy. And what I didn't know, quite honestly, was what they were going through as individuals. They were taught that uh, I was possessed. What they were trying to do was to eliminate the, op the times that I would be in public because under the Portuguese culture, if you had epilepsy, uh, it meant that somebody had committed a major sin and that God was punishing the family, not necessarily the individual, but punishing the family for the sin that had been committed. Now, if I had known that, my attitude may have been different about my family. But when they said that, they said, everybody in Los Angeles, their problems, you got to come back to Central California and come home. And I said, no. And that started the whole process of separation with my family. Um, and so then with the uh, not getting a job, uh, I started drinking a lot at three o'clock in the afternoon, I was drunk. And I always drank at one place. It was in Griffith Park in Los Angeles uh, on a mountaintop. No mountains in Griffith Park, just hills. But if you're drunk, you think it's a mountain. And so I would get drunk every day there uh, and feel sorry for myself, obviously. Um, and on the day that I was gonna do the dirty deed, I noticed that there was a merry-go-round at the bottom of that hill. And I heard a voice that said, uh, you're gonna be just like those little kids getting on and off that merry-go-round. You're never gonna let anybody or anything stop you from doing what you wanna do. I've never been depressed since. Um, I drink, but I don't get drunk. Um, I, uh, my whole life changed as a result of that. A week later, um, a priest friend of mine said, I have an opportunity for you to live with Bob Hope and his family. Now, a lot of you are way too young to know who Bob Hope was, but he was a, a very famous uh, TV comedian, comedian, had his own TV show and so forth. But I got to live with him and eat meals with him and travel and so forth and so on. One day, Mr. Hope said to me, um, listen, you think you have a ministry and it can only be practiced in a church. You're wrong. A true ministry is practiced in sports, entertainment, business, government, but where you belong is in politics. I had not been told that before. It seemed interesting. I wrote a letter to my congressman who I didn't know. Um, and he was looking uh, for somebody uh, that uh, was young, uh, interested in politics um, and that had an agriculture background. Boop, that was me. So he interviewed me, I got the job and I went to work with him. Now I had seizures working with him and didn't matter to him. He, I had my seizure, when I got through with my seizure, I went on working, he was very, very supportive, very open. Um, and it was a, a wonderful experience. Um, I had, when I ran for Congress, um, when he retired, uh, he wanted me to run, I ran. When I ran for Congress, my opponent, one night at a dinner, I like to always say it was in October, it was late, he knew he was losing. So that night at dinner, he said to the group, I don't know if you know it or not, but Tony's a very sick man. He has epilepsy. And what would you think if he went to the White House to argue a critical issue for us, such as water, in Central California, that is the most important issue. If he went to the White House and had a fit, well, several people in the audience were very disturbed that he would say that. I got calls that night 
Now, the next day, a reporter called me and said, I understand your opponent last night said X. What's your reaction? And the good Lord was with me. And I said, well, you know, I've known a lot of people uh, who went to the White House and had fits. At least I'd have an excuse. And that was it. Uh, it's made, made the press and so forth. Nobody's ever raised my epilepsy against me since then. Um, but I worked for my congressman for a while, 14 years. Um, then I got elected and uh, I decided that I wanted to do something in regards to my experiences. And so <clears throat> I'd offer amendments uh, on regards to disabilities for transportation, housing, as I remember. And what I didn't realize is that we didn't have our basic civil rights, those of us with disabilities. Uh, that a, uh, if you were going for an interview, uh, they could ask you if you had a disability and say to you point blank, because of your disability, I'm not hiring. If you went into a movie theater and you were in a chair, they could say, you're a fire hazard, you can't come in. If you went to a restaurant and asked what was on the menu because you couldn't read, you were blind, they would say, I don't have time to answer your question and you're a nuisance, get out. All very legal. So as I started thinking about this and I started working with individuals, I realized that we need to go after basic civil rights. And so I started working on the ADA. I felt very strongly that it had to be bipartisan and bicameral. Bicameral means uh, House and Senate, not just one body, but that it had to be bicameral and bipartisan. So um, I had uh, Lowell Weicker, who was a Senator from Connecticut, Republican, I uh, introduced the bill on the Senate side and I introduced the bill on the House side. Now, uh, at the time, I didn't know it, but at the time there was a grassroots uh, development going on starting in California, UC Berkeley, but all over the country um, that were pushing for some type of correction in regards to our civil rights. And uh, then, and, but I introduced the bill without knowing that I got over 50 co-sponsors. Uh, I can't remember how many were on the Senate side, but it was at the end of the Congress. So uh, we got to introduce it. Uh, but then on the next Congress, I reintroduced it. And when I reintroduced it, I had over 200 co-sponsors. And I was uh, majority whip at the time, which gave me a little influence. Uh, but the speaker uh, called me in and said, Tony, uh, I like your bill, uh, but it's really too encompassing. It's too big. And the public will react negative against it. So I'd love it if you would pull it back and uh, modify it and so forth. Now, he's number one in leadership, but I was number three. So my attitude was speak to power. I said, no. I said, I will not withdraw it. Um, and so then what he did, he assigned it to about seven different committees and 15 different subcommittees to try to slow it down. What we did was to pick the subcommittee that was the easiest to get it through. Uh, Major Owens of New York was the chairman of that subcommittee, great guy. And he moved it through that subcommittee rapidly. And so then what we did is that we went from one subcommittee to another subcommittee to a committee and so forth and kept building up the pressure because we knew that the problem was going to be in the Public Works Committee. We had trouble with a couple other committees, but the trouble was going to be in the Public Works Committee. And the reason was, is that Greyhound well, had spent a lot of money fighting us and said that it would put them out of business. We basically said, look, it. my point was, you're not going to be out of business. Technology will do things to permit you to stay in business. And we gave them, I think it was 20 years in order so that they can convert. And look at what the buses do today. They basically dance, they go up, they go down, go kinds of things so that the wheelchairs can get in, elderly people can walk into a bus and so forth and so on. It worked. 
but then we got to the House floor and we it overwhelmingly passed in the House. In the Senate, it didn't have any troubles and it overwhelmingly passed. Uh, in the Senate, the low Weicker had got defeated. So uh, Senator Ted Kennedy was the chairman of the committee. He uh, asked Tom Harkin to uh, lead on the bill and Orrin Hatch, uh, Harkin being a liberal Democrat, Orrin Hatch, a very conservative Republican, uh, and Bob Dole, who was the uh, a Republican leader, um, to co-sponsor the bill. So in the Senate, we got through because of that combination, we got through very quickly. And it was then signed into law by, as I call them, Papa Bush. Um, and the, what a lot of people don't know is that uh, um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bush, Barbara and George Bush, had a daughter die of, an uh, of a disability at an early age. So they were very strongly in support of, even though his chief of staff tried to kill her. But we got it signed in, a huge ceremony out in the White House lawn and so forth. It goes up to the Supreme Court after that. Uh, it took, you know, generally takes about, you know, six, seven, eight, ten years for legislation to be contested and, and uh, they went to the Supreme Court. The Supremes, as I call them, decided that the ADA only applied to physical disabilities. Uh, so basically they were saying to me that I didn't know what the heck I was doing because I sponsored a bill that didn't cover epilepsy. So the Epilepsy Foundation, uh, I was on the board at the time, at the time, I was not in the Congress, uh, but I said, you know, we got to take this on. So Epilepsy Foundation agreed. And we got uh, Steny Hoyer of Maryland uh, to put in the ADA Amendments Act. And it basically said that all disabilities covered by the ADA. And that meant we were reverse, we were going to reverse the Supreme Court decision, which is not easy to do. But what happened is that overwhelmingly it passed the House and Senate. And a little footnote, that bill was signed by President George W. Bush. And so then all disabilities were covered. Now, go to the Supreme Court, stigma again. Now, the stigma still exists today. Some people, uh, I brought up the fact of my heritage, Portuguese, but if you go in most cultures, uh, there is the stigma against epilepsy, possession of the devil. Um, and so that is in all different types of cultures, but you know, I'm Portuguese, so that's what I talk about. The other thing I wanna say very quickly, um, I am a devout Catholic. That did not affect my Catholicism, my belief and so forth. So when I was whip, it's a good story to tell you. When I was whip, I got to make the country, go to three different countries and take a delegation with me. That's part of what you get if you're in the leadership. So of course, I'm gonna to go to Portugal. Red carpet treatment, state dinner, speak to the parliament and the highest ranking Portuguese American ever to be elected to Congress. So that was, of course, I'm gonna do that. Well, the State Department then said, you gotta to go to Morocco and meet the king because Portuguese uh, government and the king are working on some stuff in the Middle East and we want you to uh, provide some help there. So of course I said, yes. And then I get to pick the third country. And some of you will immediately know that have heard me before, Carrie has, and Jeff and uh, Josh have heard me before. I decided I wanted to go to the Vatican, but I wanted to meet the Pope personally. So uh, it gets approved. And so I take my delegation with me and we go to, uh, we land at the Vatican to begin the trip. And we all sit down in one of the rooms there and the Pope walks in, we all stand up, he sits down. Now, I have the podium. Now I take a view that some of you who know me, I take the view whenever you have a podium, doesn't have to be a physical structure, but whenever you have the attention of everybody, you should speak up 
and try to do something, say something, whatever, but speak to power. Now, I had an opportunity to speak to the Pope, which a little bit of power, I would say quite a bit. So I read my very boring speech that the State Department and the Vatican had approved. And when that was through, um, I then, um, uh, I finished. And when I finished, I said, uh, Your Holiness, uh, I need to tell you something personal. And that is, as a young man, uh, I decided I want to become a Catholic priest. I was denied entry because uh, I have epilepsy. And canon law in 400 AD said that if you have epilepsy or possessed by the devil, you can't be a priest. I think that's very unchristian of our church, and I wish you'd look into it. Well, his minions around the room are going, yeah, 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 yeah. my delegation looked at me as if I was crazy. And, uh, but then he gets up and he speaks. He reads the very boring speech, doesn't say anything else. We take a bunch of pictures. We spend a lot of money, $5 a photo. We take all kinds of pictures and buy them and so forth. He then gets up to leave and he takes my wife's hand and walks her to the door and I walk with him. He gets to the door, turns around and blesses my wife. He turns to me, does not bless me. And as a Catholic, if the Pope doesn't bless you, you're going straight to hell. But he does not bless me. And he says to me, however, young man, I heard your comments and turns around and walks away. Now, I didn't know how to take that. I didn't know if that was bad or good or whatever. Um, but I, uh, three years later, canon law was changed to permit people with epilepsy to become priests. Now, I don't take credit for that because I don't know what happened in those two years, but I do know what I did. I do know that I stood up, spoke what I wanted, and ultimately it was changed for whatever reasons. But to me, that was one of my favorite stories about my epilepsy and what happened. So for all of you, um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk, talk to all of you. I have a lot of friends in the room that I, on, on the virtual room that I know of. And so um, I love you all. I am, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I should say very proud of my epilepsy uh, because it made me the person I am today. Uh, it created opportunities. It uh, identified me. It forced me to know me. It forced me to understand who I was. It forced me to understand my limitations, but it also gave me the courage to go after things that I wanted to have done. So I'm very, very thankful um, for my for my epilepsy. And I uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have uh, in regards to any of my comments. So thank you, Carrie, for inviting me. And uh, thank you, Tony. I hope it wasn't boring to you because you've heard a lot of it before. It's never boring, Tony, never. And I'll leave tonight and I'll think of three more questions that I wish I would have asked you. So we have a lot of people on here thanking you um, for sharing your story today. Um, and I want to say thank you also as somebody living with epilepsy, um, you've paved the way for us. And so we're very, very grateful for that. Thank you. Someone wants to know, what would you add to the ADA if you could make amendment, amendments to it today? Well, a lot of people ask me that. A lot of people say, why didn't you cover uh, jobs? Why didn't you cover X or Z? Well, you got to remember, it's a civil rights law. And no civil rights law goes into those specifics. Civil rights laws permit you to file legal action if somebody discriminates against you. The second thing that's really important for all of us to know is that the Attorney General, the Justice Department of the United States, the Attorney General can take action against a company, a business, a, a, a state government, a city, a county, a company, if they are in effect discriminating against uh, those of us with disabilities, those of us with epilepsy. So that's what a civil rights law does. 
Now, there are a lot of people who would like to open up the ADA for negative reasons. So it's been the law of the land for 30 years. And I have basically fought every amendment because I was always afraid there would be an attempt to, uh, would hurt it, would basic attempt to, to uh, kill it. In the last Congress, um, there was an attempt uh, to really uh, negate the ADA um, and it passed the House of Representatives. But we fortunately were able to kill it in the Senate and it will not go anywhere in this Congress um, in any way. And hopefully we can get by that. Uh, epilepsy uh, and disabilities uh, have never been a partisan issue. Uh, they are to some extent now, but never been a partisan issue. And they should never be. It has nothing to do with party politics or whatever, because, you know, epilepsy doesn't pay attention to whether or not you're male or female, young or old, Democrat, Republican, conservative or liberal. It doesn't pay attention. It doesn't care. It just strikes us. Um, and I always try to say that the ADA is an insurance policy for the so-called able-bodied. Because mm -hmm. it's there when you develop a, a disability. And as we know, as you get older, you do develop disabilities. Um, so I have always fought to open it up because I was afraid of what happened in the last Congress. And so the odds of us supporting opening it up are somewhat remote. To yeah, be that makes honest. sense. That makes sense. You, you almost have to protect it. Yes. Um, here's a question. How would you describe the stigma now of epilepsy as opposed to how it was when you grew up? Well, the stigma is still there. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no doubt about it. It's a, it's a difficult problem in religions, all religions, not, not necessarily just Catholicism. But it is a problem in all religions, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I wish we could have done was to uh, make religions uh, 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 restricted under the law. But if we had put religion in there, we would have never passed the bill. Mm -hmm. So we excluded religions. But to if you you go to a church, a lot of churches, for some reason, all have all of them have steps. That denies entry to a lot of people with disabilities. Uh, but if you also take the fact that people from different cultures grew up with epilepsy being possessed by the devil, um, some ministers in some religions still preach that today. So it's not something from yesterday. Now, have we made progress? You're darn right we have. We've made a lot of progress, but we still have the problem. And, um, and that's something that um, I fight a lot. Um, the stigma uh, for any disability, but the stigma for epilepsy uh, that uh, so many people end up getting hurt because of that. But, and some people say to me, Tony, why don't you change the name of epilepsy uh, because of X? And I say, well, you know, in my view, if you change the name of epilepsy, you're in effect saying stigma wins. And I'm not willing to do that. You know, I have epilepsy and I want people to understand what my epilepsy is and accept me for what I can and what I cannot do. There's a lot of things I can't do because of my epilepsy. But damn, there's a lot of things I can do better than a lot of people who don't have epilepsy. And so that's, I feel very, very strongly about that. And here's a question for you. So we know that um, in spite of all the progress that's been made, like you said, and that's a lot of that is thanks to you, Tony. Uh, we all know that there is still discrimination that takes place. What is your advice for people who still find themselves in such a situation? I think the first thing to do is to educate. And I'm sure that in a lot of cases that doesn't do any good, but try to educate. Uh, the Epilepsy Foundation and all the affiliates and chapters across the country can help you in regards to that um, and making great progress. I want you to know. But the thing is to educate. If there is a specific um, discrimination, you can go to court, you can file action and the ADA covers you. 
Now, if it's inherent uh, in a particular organization, uh, a particular company and so forth, then the Justice Department or the State Department of Justice, but the Justice Department can take action against that company or that organization. Now, the important thing is when you vote for president, remember that the attorney general is appointed by the president. If you get an attorney general or a president who doesn't believe in the ADA, then you're out of luck for four years or eight years. Uh, but thank God we've had presidents. Uh, President Clinton was aggressively supportive. Uh, Papa Bush was aggressively supportive. Uh, w was ex aggressively supportive. Uh, Obama was aggressively supportive. And Biden is aggressively supportive. So um, those justice departments and those attorney generals file a lot of actions. We got the most action we got enforcing the ADA uh, which, of course, includes epilepsy, but was during the Obama administration, the eight years there, the Justice Department was very aggressive, going after companies, going after cities, going after states, and so forth. So it's enforcement of the law that is critical. All civil rights bills depend on enforcement. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, so I have a question here. It says, where is the education in the religious institutions about epilepsy? I wish I knew. Yeah. Um, let me tell you, uh, <laughs> what I've done, uh, I've uh, tried to meet with um, ministers, priests, um, pastors, and so forth. I was very involved with a group uh, that reached out to religious leaders. Um, and we made progress, but there are uh, uh, several people of the cloth, I should say, that still preach uh, possession by the devil. And, and that's sad. I mean, the previous speaker talked about Tanzania and the problems there. Uh, well, that isn't not only in Africa. Uh, we have it in the Asian countries, big time. Uh, we have it in a lot of European countries. You know what? We have it here in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, where people of the cloth uh, uh, immediately think that uh, we're possessed. Um, and that's sad. And I, what I do all the time when I know about it, and in particular minister of the cloth, I really go after, I don't, I shouldn't say go after them. I go after finding them in order to try to educate them. And mm -hmm. to a great extent, that's what we have to do. That's what the Epilepsy Foundation does. Carrie, that's what you do, uh, and so forth. And that's the way we have to do it. Mm -hmm. It's a violation of the law. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's a good way to end it, Tony. I think that if we just, you know, the only way to erase the stigma going forward is just educate, 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 you know, and we have that amazing foundation um, with the uh, ADA to build on and um, as our fallback. So we all here at the foundation, all of us living with epilepsy every day, we, we can't thank you enough. And you. um, your story just gets better every time I hear it. But let me just say one thing before I leave, and that is don't be afraid to speak up. When somebody uses a stigma against you or somebody you know or love, speak up. That's what it takes is speaking up to somebody who is ill-informed or prejudiced, mm -hmm. but let's say ill-informed. And so you speak up to make them understand that you don't agree with them and maybe you'll have an impact. That's what counts. I love that. Speak to power. Isn't that what you said? Right. Speak to power. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, thank Carrie. You. Thank you everybody for listening. Yes. Thank you, Joyce, again. Thank you, Joyce, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to go back over to here again, over to my slides. And um, you, you did the poll at the beginning, so we're going to ask that you do it again here at the end. Just give my computer a minute to warm up. <clears throat> Thank you. Rena Lachlan is working behind the scenes and she's doing a fantastic job tonight. So round of applause for Rena. And so here we go. There is that 
survey is now in progress. We want to thank everybody that came tonight. We want to thank our amazing speakers that we had. Um, we couldn't do programs like this without you. So we're so, so uh, happy that you were able to join us tonight. And there's information for the foundation. If you need anything from us, please visit our website. Please email us. Uh, we would love to hear more from you. And once that polling is down, you're free to uh, go for the evening. Thank you again and happy International Epilepsy Day. Hope you had a great day and I hope you really enjoyed our program tonight. Thank you.